you were a very young man when you got involved with this project. Yeah, I was 22. I'd just come from university and I joined Granada. I'd done six months on a general training course. But the great thing about Granada was it was a very small company, so it couldn't really afford to train. So you really mm -hmm. had to do it on the job. And the first job I got was as a researcher on this one-off documentary. It was just going to be one documentary looking at England in 1963-64. was my first job. And now here you are. Here I am. This was a project that would consume all the rest of your life and still isn't finished. Yeah. I mean, it's in a sense, you know, the, it's the perimeters of my life in a way. I mean, it's my work in life, it's the first thing I'll do and it's still going on. And who would have thought that 40 odd years later, 42 years later, we'd still be doing it, still be talking about it. That's a remarkable thing to me about the film because, uh, and you can call it the film or the films. In a way, it's one work. In a way, it's a work that's still being finished. Some people coming to it now can see it all at once, immediately. But for you making it, for me watching it, I've grown up seven years between each film, just as the characters have, and it's become part of my life because as they grow older and as they go through these things, so do I, and so do you. Yeah. So it's a different perception, isn't it? I mean, people who see it now and catch up with it. it, it it's sort of like, almost like reality television, mm -hmm. except you get the inst instant gratification for them. You know, people who, who came out in a box set, people who saw the box set, then come to me and say, well, when's the next one? Mm -hmm. When's the next one? You know, but it's a whole different rhythm. You know? And now, once you're trapped into it, you have to wait and wait and sit it up. Mm -hmm. But it must be odd, you know, for people who see the whole thing, you know, however quickly they see it, but basically in one big chunk. What effect does it have on them? Is it as meaningful to them? I don't know. The, the, the those of us who have grown up with it, you know, it becomes, as you say, part of our lives. And also, I think it gives us a strong political context. It's one thing I've always avoided doing is putting big political signposts in it, saying, mm -hmm. I did it once in '42 and it never worked. I cut it out. It was the year Diana was killed. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I asked them all about that, to just to give it some sense of time and place, right. but it just seemed trivial, not that the event was trivial, but it seemed the film only really works when it's about them, and the politics of the film are their lives, and the way their lives change, they dramatize politics, they don't discuss the abstracts of politics, they are political, their lives are political statements, like Tony wanting to leave the country, tired mm -hmm. of Blair, tired of eight years of the Labour government, all that sort of thing, fed up with it all. I mean, that's a political statement. It isn't him pontificating about it. And so, you know, when you, when you live through the films that we have, then you're always in the political context of right. the time. When you see it in the great bulk, then it must be odd. You must sometimes feel you're in a time capsule or something. You know, there was a, uh, uh, a person on the internet who uh, got the box set and started to watch the first film. And during the next 24 hours, although not necessarily consecutively, had seen them all. And then posted this notice uh, saying that it was a metaphysical experience for him, that in a way he had seen not their lives, but life itself mm. flashing across yeah. his, his screen. Yeah, and because that's what it is. It it's is. what life is like. And it's your own life, too. Yes. I mean, you would see your own life flash past. I mean, if you if you're sat here in Chicago watching it, it's a different uh, you know a different power than if you're sat in London. I mean, in my great country, but you know you must be watching your own life go through, which is the power of the thing. I always felt that you know it's everyone can relate to a little bit of it right. somewhere along the lines, apart from the big view, the overview of it all. There's something in it for everybody. I think a piece of a memory, a piece of a relationship. Something someone says, some response that someone has that, that, that sort of connects with everybody you're watching. You know, the whole crowd in the 49 up film uh, seem happier yeah. than they have been in general. Mm -hmm. Some of them have been happy before, mm -hmm. but there, there seems to be a, a reconciliation with life, an acceptance, or a, a certain serenity yeah. uh, in many of them. Um, I think that, that's, that's interesting because I, I think. One of the interesting things about seeing all the films, having them all in front of you, mm -hmm. and not having to wait seven years, is they're all quite different. 
the tone of them is quite different, I've always felt. And I never know what the tone is until I've shot the film, until I start putting it together. But for example, 35, there was a lot of, a lot of them were losing their parents. LJ, yeah. You know, and so there was a f sense of mortality about it. There was, a, there was a kind of awareness that you know, life isn't forever, that things leave you, things go on, things move on. And then, as you say, at 49, there seems to be an acceptance, not, not, not in a negative way, but really a, a, a kind of just, you know, the fact of being, knowing who you are, having a certain confidence in your own, and being, mm -hmm. I suppose, the cliche of being comfortable in your own skin. Mm -hmm. Which is used by one of the characters for the first right. time, she says. Right. And then, you know, look at 28, that's very, in a sense, almost overbearing, the way that they are sort of so full of confidence and so full of, and indeed at 21, you know. So there's a different atmosphere to each of the films. At 21, there's a lot of uncertainty, too. Yes. And some angst. Yes. And is it Susie who's the chain smoker? Completely, completely yes. changed then, from 21 from to 28. From 21 to 28, it's as dramatic as Neil. Yes. Between uh, uh, 35 mm -hmm. and 42. It's yeah. incredible because she has, she flowers into a self-confident, charming woman who's comfortable with herself and at 21 she looked like she was coming to pieces. I know, and she's a strange story because she, from, by all accounts, I've lost her now. I mean, she, in 49, she sort of signs off and says, I'm not doing any more. But she's one of the great stories of the series mm -hmm. and, you know, people really like her, people really respond to her in a way that I don't think she quite grasped. Oh, I liked her in 40. Yeah, yeah. yeah she's, she's wonderful. And uh, yet she, I don't know what it is, but she finds it tremendously difficult to do in a great invasion. I think I've lost yeah, it. Yeah, because this isn't a documentary about these lives so much as a documentary about life. Yes. And as you sense them at the various ages, you look at them physically, they've changed. You can still see the face of the child. Absolutely. All the way through life, but nevertheless, hair falls out and waistlines yeah. expand. And, uh, at the same time, what the tone of their voice tells us is really more important than having another half an hour of information about yes. biographically what yeah. they did in the last seven years. I agree, I, and I've had a, an instinct about that too, and so I've always tried to, to keep it crisp, to keep it mm -hmm. moving, and not to kind of let it get maudlin or self-indulgent or, 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 or whatever, because I, I think, you know, you just need to keep the thing moving, you need to keep because there's a lot of information. When you're not just you're not just absorbing what's happening to them now, but you're reabsorbing what happened to them before. All those kind of you know, impulses that you're you're getting that fed into your nervous system. So I've always tried to to keep it under some sort of control. But yes, and, and what's been interesting with 49 is now I've got new technology. Now mm -hmm. this is the first one I've done on digital, which is a huge benefit to me because I can do very long interviews. Before, mm. all the way up to 42, we were doing them on film, and so after every 10 minutes you'd have to change roles. And it was very hard to kind of keep focused and try and get after them, you know, get underneath them, get into them, and all this mm. sort of stuff when you had kept having to stop and start. Now I can shoot for 38 minutes without stopping. Mm. And also you need less equipment, so it's much more intimate relationship between me and them. There's not a large crew around. So the technology, the change of technology has been very, very interesting and useful to me. You've um, <coughs> said that a couple of things you did which you regretted. You, uh, there were two characters where you thought you could anticipate yeah. what would happen in their lives. In one of them you were right, although you were a bit off on your time scheme. And yeah. the other one you were wrong. Yeah. Tony is um, a good way to start the film because he is so happy down there in Spain yeah. in the swimming pool. I know. And yeah. uh, uh, that that little boy at the beginning looks like uh, Truffaut's hero in 400 Blows. He's peering out of the screen in bafflement. Yeah. And here is this confident 49-year-old, expansive, happy mm. man who has some complaints, but um, he's got he's been able to solve it by getting his holiday cottage and he and his wife are working hard. And That's right. Yeah. It's incredible. But he's, he embraces life, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. I mean, he just attacks life as such. You know, he's, he's hard work because he's so enthusiastic. You know, he's so okay. full of everything, so full of ideas. So it's, it's sort of tiring being around him sometimes. But, you know, he, he has done incredibly well. When you and think yet, when he was 21, you were convinced he was going to be a criminal. I was, yeah, I was. I mean, I, it's this terrible, terrible impulse to play God.
which is one of the attractions of the film, but something that I can't indulge myself in. It's fun for you to watch it and say, well, I think this is what is going to happen to them. But I, if I make the next film, in a sense, you know, with some agenda, then it'll become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that's exactly what I did. You know, I, I, I tried to predict what was going to happen to Tony. I tried to predict what was going to happen to you know, to Nick's marriage, Nick, yeah. and uh, you know, once I was right, once I was wrong, but it was it was a foolish thing to do, I think. You ask some questions occasionally um, that are, I, I guess you have an instinct for what you can ask these people, because you ask Neil if he thinks he's going mad. Yeah. I mean, it, that's kind of an interesting <coughs> question to ask yeah. someone, and he answers it very seriously, he's yeah. afraid he might be, yeah. and we're afraid he might be too, and so we're grateful to you that you have a relationship with him yeah. that allows that question to be asked because the subject is right there on the screen. There is, and there's one question I, I think it was 35, 42, I asked Tony um, when he was giving me another of his, what he was going to do with his life and all this. <laughs> and I think I said to him, but you know, you failed in everything. And I, and I remember watching the film in an audience, you know, and the audience went gasped, and I thought, it was a very tough question, you know, and maybe it was too tough, and I hadn't really even realized it until I'd sat in a crowd of people watching the mm -hmm. film. But I, I think that's key to really what the, the film is about. It's my relationship with them, and I know how far I can go with them individually, how far I can push them, and, and, and you know, what they're emotional about. And I don't mean push their buttons so much, but, and, and there's a trust between us, mm -hmm. I think, you know, because none of them have ever turned their back on me and said, you know, they're unhappy with how it's been gone, how it's been treated, how it's been done, whatever. No one's ever turned their back on me, so no one's ever complained about it. So, you know, I think it's because of this very unusual relationship we have that, as you were saying, I mean, I know these people better than almost anybody alive. I've known them for 42 years. Nobody else in their life has come into the, <coughs> into them every seven years and asked them how they're doing. No, no. And, you know, so I think it's because there's a sort of trust, and I know what they won't want to talk about, you know. And, and again, I mean, they're in a very powerful position because as a longitudinal documentarian, you have to be on your best behavior because if they say, I don't want to talk about sex, I don't want to talk about money or something like that, and you do it, and you use it, then they won't let you back in again, you know. So they do have a great power over me in some ways. The first film, uh very definitely sets itself up as being about the British class system. Yes. You have rich kids and poor kids, and yeah. you later said you wish you'd had more middle class yeah. people than you do. And then, uh, as the years have gone past, has the class system persisted in their lives, or to what degree have some of them moved outside? I think a lot of them have moved outside it. I think that kind of oppressive class barriers has diminished a lot. Mm -hmm. and, and I, it's a very deceptive film because people say, well, this, is this a portrait of England? And I, I say, well, this is a portrait of people who were born in 1956. You know, this is a, a portrait of that generation. Had I started the film seven years later and 10 years later, I think it would have been different. So it's, it's very hard to draw a massive kind of conclusion or definitive view of English society. And I think that was the great kind of metamorphosis that the film and I went through that it did definitely started out as a political with a political yeah. agenda. It was a very socialist left wing company, Granada Television, working on a very, very <coughs> provocative program, World in Action. Very left wing, very aggressive, you know, and this was a film saying this is the state of the country, it's not good enough, you know. Social barriers shouldn't exist. They're a great waste of people's time and talent. And the humanity of the film I think came out after 21, when we kind of grown through all that. And yeah. Those arguments weren't, weren't meaningful anymore, but what was meaningful was the people. When you think back to when they were born in 1956, in a sense that was still the old England. There yeah. were still um, shortages yeah. of consumer goods. Yeah. There was still poverty. There was yeah. still um, the war wasn't over with yet in terms of economic well yeah. And 63, when you film it, is that year that Larkin said, sexual intercourse began in 1963, <laughs> a little too late for me, between the ending of the Chatterley Band right. and the Beatles' first LP. 63 was the Beatles. Yeah. And the Beatles, for many people, 
that year represents the difference between <coughs> people wearing suits and ties and hats yeah, yeah. and everything since. And that wasn't an accident. And because when they grew up, with the, especially the East Enders, they were growing up in an East End that was much the same as it might have been 20, 30, 40, yeah. 100 years earlier. And the, you know, it was no accident that this film got made in 1963 because people suddenly thought, is mm -hmm. England changing? We had the theater, we had Look Back in Anger. You know, we had, as you say, music, we had fashion. Angry young men in town. Absolutely. So was mm -hmm. English society changing, or was this cosmetic? And I think that's what the impulse, everybody, England was waking, we were hoping, from a big sleep. You know, the war was finally over, and people were having sexual intercourse and all this sort of thing. And this documentary just simply came out of that feeling mm -hmm. that maybe there was a brave new world out there. And of course, this film had a huge dampening effect on it because you could see that it all might be all very well to have the Beatles album and Mary Quant and John Osborne and all that sort of thing. But for the <coughs> everyday working life of people, this class system was very much alive and well. It was us and them. You know, it was it was it was the empowered and the unempowered, and the difference between the two was dramatic. Seven-year-olds hadn't a clue about their education, where they were going, what they were doing. There was very little parental support for them. Um, they were at the mercy of the exigencies of the school, if it was a good school, if it was a compassionate teacher. Whereas, you know, the, 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 the empowered knew exactly what they were going to do and did exactly what they were going to do. But that's what's thrilling about the film, is, is that optimism in it, that that generation, it was possible to come through, to, to, to break through. And it was my good luck to be of that time 15 years older than that, that I could document that, that awakening, as I call it. Britain woke up in the, in the 60s, America woke up after Eisenhower with Kennedy. And I documented that generation who you know, assumed adulthood in that period, mm -hmm. in that period of time. And so it was a very dramatic, a very vivid sense of social movement, much more than had I started 10 years later or even 10 years earlier. I hit a period when life really did change very dramatically. The whole culture, both the American and the English culture, changed dramatically, culturally, politically, economically, every way. And my film, in a sense, is a history of that. You know, um, at the same time that their lives changed dramatically, their personalities didn't um, much. Uh, the thing that struck me, the very first of film that I saw, those years ago, and I think it must have been 14, or certainly was 21, yeah. um, that in the faces of those children, already you see everything that you're going to see later. The personality, the, the slant on life. Now they may go through little dips and changes along the way, but at the end, when they're 49, there is a child that you saw at seven. It's almost as if whatever has happened by seven is going to set the course. Yeah. I mean, is that true? I mean, I, I think what you're saying is pretty much true. I think that core personality that you see at seven doesn't much change. I mean, you can't predict people's lives. You don't know what is going to be thrown at people. You know what <clears throat> good luck, bad fortune, whatever is going to be thrown at people. But I think when you see these films, especially if you see them in a great bulk, that I think you can see a core personality there. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, maybe the Jesuits were right. You know, show me the child until he is seven and I will give you the man. You don't know what that man is going to be doing, but you can sense how he's going to react to stuff, how he's going to respond to it. Mm -hmm. that, <clears throat> that look in the eye, that twinkle in Neil's eye, which disappeared for generations, is, is coming back again. Yeah. And he, wasn't he the one who at one point wanted to be a tour bus guy? Yes, yes. And he wanted to tell the people what to look at through the window. Yes, that's right. And then later, after his period of wandering in the outskirts of society, he gets back on board running the village FET right. in, that, uh, in the Shetland Islands. Yes. Which is, he's making people look at what, here, look at this. Yeah. He's still a tour bus guy. Yeah. He's saying, here, I, I, I'm... Right. I'm in the I, play, yeah. Yeah. the drama. And now, as a politician, he's also saying, I'm going to tell you what to do. Yeah. He wants to kind there of be go. the supervisor. There you go. I mean, it's interesting, you know, that one of the most socially mobile people 
example is Bruce, mm -hmm. who started out in a very privileged boarding school and then St. Paul's school and then Oxford school and then was teaching Bangladeshi children. But even in those early, the f one of the first things he said at seven, you know, I want to be a missionary. <coughs> mm -hmm. There's a kind of compassion in that seven-year-old face that is never going to leave him, that will be with him his whole life. You know, that's his essence and that essence was manifest at seven. And even though he, at the end, is teaching in a, uh, a school with a better salary right. and drives a better car, sure. uh, actually a teacher is a missionary no matter who the mm. students are, yeah. I suppose. So, you know, it is because people say to me, well, what are the great lessons you can draw? Can you predict people's lives? I don't think you can predict people's lives. But I think there is something at the heart of this film which shows that, you know, life is eternal, that people's spirit lives on. Now, if Although you've, with one exception, you've kept to the seven-year rule. Yeah. What would you do if you found that one of your subjects was dying? This is uh, extremely worrying, you know. I mean, it's a question now we have to face. I mean, uh, there's no one in mind at all, but it now becomes part of the, the agenda. I, I think in 56 Up, I wouldn't want to hear your voice saying, so-and-so died. I think I would almost want to see them in this sounds so bad, but uh, I hope you understand the spirit in which I mean it. I would like to hear their their thoughts when they realize that the end may be coming. So you think I should do it? Well, that's the last chance they'll have. Yeah. Uh, I think so you're right. I think it would be too cold, because I mean, this has been troubling me so for the last 20 years. How do I handle that? I hope I go first. You know, I hope mm -hmm. that uh, they all outlive me. You know, um, if you should go first, Shouldn't somebody else continue on? Shouldn't this project continue until <coughs> everyone know. is? I, I think it should. When I became a film critic, I had no idea that you could do it for more than five years. Right. And I certainly had no idea that I wanted to spend my life being a film critic. But now as I look back after 40 years, that's what I've done. And so uh, there's a, a reconciliation. Right. And with these people, this, first of all, most of them are happy. Yeah. Many of them. Uh, have grandchildren. Maybe they, do they all? No. Not quite all. No, but they, and they love their grandchildren. Right. And basically they're happy with their children. They have a few worries with this one or that one. But there's pride in their voice. Yeah. And the returns are in. I mean, earlier they're still striving. Mm -hmm. They're still, I've got to prove myself. I've got to find my own way. Now, whatever's happened, it's happened. Yeah. And a lot of the returns are in. And they can see maybe that this film that they were in was a wonderful opportunity for yeah. them, which they didn't necessarily love or embrace, but yeah. that it happened yeah. to them too. That's right, because I think they've behaved with dignity throughout it, mm -hmm. and they've been treated with dignity. Uh, one of them, Sue, the, the wife of Paul, mm -hmm. I didn't think I was able to use it. She, you know, she just had a wonderful expression about how every life is an act of courage and everybody has a story. You know, and that's what I love about the films, is that these are ordinary lives, ordinary stories, but they're told in such a dignified way. And they elevate the ordinary life to real drama and real dignity. And, and I, think, I think they're beginning to realize that. I, I just got a sense for the first time that there was some pride in it. Well, as I said, I, I really felt that they're happier now than they've ever been before as a group. Yeah. And they're wiser. Mm -hmm. They're wiser about life. You do learn, don't you, as you yeah. old, a few things. If we had any piece of film at all from the year 1000 or the year 500, it'd be fascinating to see. Mm -hmm. Or those first films in Paris of the people coming out of the metro when they were inventing the cinema. Just look at those people and you think, well, now I'm looking at somebody who was alive in 1898. This project, as it continues and finally concludes, and becomes a piece of film, 56 up, uh, 63 up, 70 up. Then 100 years from now, 200 years from now, how fascinating this will be. Uh, what a film to show in a, in a classroom uh, 200 years from now. Yeah. Uh, no, I think the big contribution I made to all this is just to keep it going. Mm -hmm. You know, it would have been easy to have stopped it, to have moved on and just carried on doing the movies and all that. And sometimes you tear your hair out trying to get them all to agree to do it and, and all this. It's, it's the most arduous part of 
actually making the film is that period when I s ring them up and say it's, the time is coming up and they say oh well I'm not sure whether but you know we've hung in I mean Claire Lewis who's worked with me for the last four and Margaret Bottomley who died who did the early ones we've kind of just hung in with it and kept it going and people say to me you know when when is it going to stop and I think well it shouldn't stop it should just keep it going you know I mean and as you said if when I go someone else could take it over but it's such, and you know, when, when, when the guys who won't do it, and I say, I, I don't, you don't have to do a long, difficult interview, just come in and count to ten, you know, just to look at you, just to see your face. Because both of them have had so, it's such interesting lives, Peter and Charles, and you, know, you don't have to go through the ardu arduousness of me interviewing them, and, you know, you can do whatever you want, but just to see these people, which is what you're saying, just the simple, simple so human history is most simple. And film does that so brilliantly, doesn't it? Because it's so complicated, much more, much more powerful, dare I say, than a book. The equivalent oh, yes. of this is just there's so much information coming at you out of the corner of your eye. You know, the way their haircuts change, the way their clothes change, the way the backgrounds change. It just, it just gives you just a history, doesn't it? And, a, and it's not a pushy history. It's not political history, it isn't trying to make points, it's just dealing with these people's lives. <clears throat> As I said, it kind of, it dignifies the ordinary life, this great world of celebrity and whatever that we're living in, which may get worse as it goes on, who knows, but it, it does honor the ordinary life, and I think that's what I think the most powerful thing about it is, and I'm just happy that I hung in with it. <laughs> oh, I, I am too. Um, I think it's the most noble use of film that I've been able to witness as a, as a film goer. And uh, uh, noble in its simplicity, and its honesty, and its directness, and its lack of pretension or grandiosity, just the, the gaze of an interested observer coming into these lives and saying, how you doing? Yeah, and uh, it also, I mean, it, it is a family too. I mean, I've kept the same people with me. I mean, George Turner's shot it since 21, and Kim Horn's edited since 28 and you know I just keep people around and there is I mean it sounds a bit nauseating oh it's a big family a big happy family because it's tough stuff what we talk about some of the times but nonetheless there is a there's a feeling of love about it which kind of transmits which you know you could take anybody apart and you could do t I could you could make a film of these 12 people and take them apart and all that sort of stuff and show bad sides and laugh at them or whatever yeah. but you know, I don't think, I never felt that that, I don't think the films have ever been kind of sycophantic in a sense. I think they've kind of had a balanced look at it. But nonetheless, underneath it all is, a, is an affection for them, which I think is important than any piece of film, any work of art in a sense. You know, there has to be a feeling. You know, out of feeling and love comes any sort of art, I think. Well, I'm just happy that, uh, that there's going to be a 56 up. Yeah. Oh, and we, we hope for 63 yeah. and so forth. Yeah. And uh, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to talk to you about it because yeah. I really think that uh, if you're going to devote your life as I have to writing about the films, it validates that career choice of mine right. and all these careers that you've had yeah. in this film, uh, that there's a project like this mm -hmm. because it shows how film is a time machine mm -hmm. and is an empathetic device like no other. And uh, the fact that you've worked on this and stuck with it at uh, uh, great inconvenience and despite the resentment of your subjects on occasion uh, has produced a great work. Well, thank you. I'm honored that, honored that you should think so.